irreversible coma. The last thing he saw was his hotel room. He never regained consciousness. And death shall have no dominion under the windings of the sea. They lying long shall not die windily, twisting on racks when sinews give way, strapped to a wheel, yet they shall not break. Faith in their hand shall snap in two, and the unicorn evils run them through. Split all ends up, they shan't crack, and death shall have no dominion. Why are we so preoccupied with the details of Dylan Thomas's death? Why linger over this image of the overweight little man with the touchingly tiny hands who breathed his last surrounded by crowds of spectators. Sometimes up to 200 of them came in off the street to press against the glass at the end of the ward where he was lying. Well, he was something of a celebrity when he was alive, but his death made him a legend. I'm standing on the balcony of the boathouse, the place where Thomas and his family lived during the last years of his life. It's now firmly on the tourist map, a place of literary pilgrimage in Larne, an idyllic small village by the sea. When he was recovering from his trips to London or later on to the States, he would um, be in a state of collapse. And my mother would put him to bed and she would feed him milk sops. In fact, when he finally collapsed, she said the trouble with these American women was that they didn't know how to look after him. The nurse role almost immediately became my leading role. <laughs> and uh, quite early on, he, uh, oh, I don't know, he said he wasn't going to do something to him. Bloody well wasn't going to call so and so or whatever it was. And I said, Dylan, you really must. And then facetiously, I said, after all, as your nurse and your manager, I have the say in these things. To which she said, You're not my nurse, you're not my manager, you're my love. So that that was the relationship. <laughs> Oh my God, those American women are absolutely shameless. They were sending him flowers, they were all over him. That made me furious, you know. There was I slaving away in the bog, as you with my children, and there was he gallivanting up, and you know, I was really absolutely mad with rage. Dylan died on his fourth trip to America. As we go back in time, only a few months earlier, we find him on his third tour, April to June, 1953. These nationwide tours were exhausting. Though they helped to make him famous, they did nothing for his marriage or his already fragile health. One fellow said to him, why, Mr. Thomas, have you come to the United States on this occasion? And Dylan said, in my eternal search for naked women in diaphanous Macintoshes. He always turned up for his engagements. He managed that, but it was costing him too much because then he was required to entertain basically his hosts, go to parties, meet people, and then very early next morning after inadequate sleep, he would be on the train or someone would be ferrying him to the next engagement. He was being lionized. And he was eating it up. The women throwing themselves at him, being outrageous whenever he had a chance to be. I think what really did my father in on that last trip particularly, and, and the previous one, was that Time magazine had come out with an article depicting him as a sponger, a liar and a thief. And somebody who pinched the bottoms of all the faculty wives, made passes at the students and so forth. And of course then, everyone's expectations were such 
that if he didn't behave in that way, people were slightly disappointed. At, at times, so I say, he, he felt a sense of guilt. Getting his letters from Caitlin, he would forget sometimes to send money back when needed for the children, I hope. So he would send these poisonous letters. There was torment, yeah. I'm writing this in Poker Flat Saloon, Sedona, Arizona, surrounded by genuine cowboys and 10-gallon Stetson and being treated to rye whiskey by a sheriff with two pearl-handled revolvers in his belt. Wish you were with us. Love, Dylan. Mother still took the top of the egg off um, for my father. He did really absolutely nothing domestically. We had a desk up here in the sitting room. He would answer his letters and do all the sort of preparatory business of the day, which wasn't creative writing. Then he would go to his father and they would do the Times crossword. Then he would go to the pub, Brown's Hotel, that was 11 o'clock. He desperately wanted his father to approve his creative work. And he always showed his father his latest work. He was completely devoted to his parents. My grandmother was a very maternal sort of person, but she just hadn't had the educational opportunities that her husband, DJ, had had. DJ never smiled. He just wore a trilby to cover his baldness, and he was very severe, and I can never remember him ever smiling at anybody. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. This simple, half-Christian, half-pagan challenge to the power of death has a universal appeal. It's a villanelle, a 19-line poem with only two rhymes and a repeated chorus line. Not an easy thing to write in English, but Dylan Thomas was as precise as he was original about verse form. It was written in 1951 for DJ, his father, who was dying, a retired, defeated schoolmaster. But it's a look back over the poet's shoulder at a once terrifying figure, an old-fashioned atheist who'd shake his fist at God and the mess he'd made of the world. Dylan used to come in, he used to come in every day, and they used to do the Times crossword. That was the starting of the day, oh, yeah. always. And then Daddy, he would beat him as, as regards um, knowing the old masters, you know, quotations and so on. But, uh, of course, before the end.